Romans chapter 4 this week, if you want to turn in your Bible uh, or an app on your phone, or maybe you don't have a Bible, you want to, there might be one near you in the seats. And I say all that because this is, the text is what matters, and we want that to be the priority and the emphasis and our, our rule. It, it sets as the authority in this church. And um, it is that which we follow. So what happens in history is important to any people. And when often even when people make arguments for something, they'll use a historical argument and maybe point out someone's ancestors. And that's why there's such controversy about a revision of American history or what happened in American history or what you erase and what you keep and um, all of that. And uh, I mentioned this morning in the announcements there that um, um, a history about 30 years ago in our own church. Uh, and as soon as we hear that, it kind of draws us into something, right? Um, and Paul has been talking about salvation by faith alone uh, throughout chapter 3, before that he introduced it and then gave a lengthy, about a lengthy section between chapter 1 verse 18 through the middle part of chapter 3 about the sinfulness of humanity, both the Gentile world, the self-righteous religious people, and the Jews particularly. And then what he does is like a good lawyer, so I want you to think of Paul as like the lawyer of grace and the, the gospel lawyer and so he's made that case, and now he brings a couple exhibits to the table. And he brings two from the heritage and the ancestry of the Jews particularly, and he gives this historical argument to make it appealing, it makes it real. It's something that's been in the abstract so far, and now he gives a model or a picture, and that's what an illustration is. And so you don't need a sermon illustration for this text because that's what Paul's doing. He's giving us an illustration of what this justification by faith alone looks like when he brings up Abraham and then David. So he brings two exhibits to the table in chapter 4. The first is exhibit A. A is for Abraham. And B is for David. <laughs> so... Um, um, so we'll get to David in a couple weeks, but he, this section is about believing and belonging, that faith is a family event, that we are saved in a personal relationship with the Lord, but not just individually. God doesn't just save us as an individual and give us a, a number and wait until our number is called at the rapture. No, he brings us into the body. He brings us into the faith family, and we belong to Abraham's family, as we'll see as we get to the end of chapter 4. And so faith is this family thing. True believers, Jew and Gentile, belong to Abraham's family. And so in this section that we're going to consider this morning, verses 1 to 5, there's a question in verse 1 that is answered in verses 2 to 5. And verse 2 gives an answer and argues for justification by faith alone. The end of which chapter, verse 3 gives the standard of truth, and then 4 and 5 elaborate on what has been said. And what, he's, what Paul is doing is saying that Abraham's story proves his argument, and that Abraham is a prototype of every Christian and everyone in this room. And so let's read Romans 4, verses 1 to 5 as our text. This is God's word. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are counted as a gift, but as his due. Not counted as a gift, but as his due. Excuse me. Verse 5, and to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. This is God's word. May God has his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's ask God to help us. Father, we declare dependence upon you, and we ask for illumination, that 
understanding the scriptures is how we know salvation. And oh God, I pray that you would let this text speak. And I pray that it would nourish your church. And I pray that it would give faith to hearers that don't have faith. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Briefly, I want to give a reminder of where Paul has had us, that he's talked about righteousness as something not that we produce, but as something that God provides. How can someone be right with God? How does a sinner get right with God? They need righteousness. And we, we went over some history of this in his, of, of this, these passages in the Reformation, and the end of chapter 3 answered the question for us, how did God make this righteousness available righteously? How can God justly justify unjust sinners? And the answer that the chapter gave us was by propitiating or appeasing his own wrath by sending his righteous son to pay the penalty for those who were justly condemned under that wrath. And so God gives this righteous offer, but he does it in a righteous way. And we receive a righteousness that we don't have. And we receive a righteousness that we cannot earn. He told us over and over in chapter 1, 2, and 3 that we are under sin. Whether that be Gentiles, Jews, pagan, religious, moral, there's under the law, there's not under the law, there's no distinction. And the humans desire justification and we want right to be prevailed. And that's why there's religion all over the world. And humans are inherently religious. And even their blindness and disconnected and they're aware of this judgment coming and seek to be right with God. And, and so you could categorize all the religions of the world as those that try to gain rightness or a right relationship with God by human achievement. Or the, uh, the, the exception is Christianity by divine achievement, what God has done for us. So we receive this righteousness by faith alone. And chapter 3 told us that it was to show something. He gave us a couple purpose statements that this was to show, it was received by faith to show God's character. And so that God can be the just and the justifier. That, he, that the motivation for this was God's love, but also his justice. And I shared with you that both of those are important. Tim Keller, as I mentioned last week, said, unless your God is a God of both sacrificial love and holy anger against evil, it will introduce distortions in your life. If you're not understanding God as holy and angry against sin, and he has holy wrath against sin, and also a God of love, if you, if you emphasize one as opposed to the other, you'll be in weird distortions with the gospel. We need both. That it was the cross where the stroke that showed the greatest love of God was also the stroke that showed the, dra- the greatest justice of God. That on the cross, with this stroke of smiting his own son for the out of the wrath of God against sin is on bearing our stripes is also the great love of God to offer up that sacrifice for us to offer us that gift and so this idea of salvation by faith alone comes up and then he introduces Abraham with this question what then shall we say was gained by Abraham our forefather according to the flesh I want you to note here, our first thing as we look at this passage about Abraham being saved, and I don't want you to miss the obvious, because it's easy for me to do that. That When he refers to Abraham and David, he's referring to guys in the Old Testament. Um, And that's very simple, and it's also very profound. It It reminds us that salvation history starts in Genesis 1 didn't start in Matthew 1. Sometimes there's a tendency in one of the most popular doc- doctrinal positions in the United States to literally, and even though they wouldn't say it outright sometimes, that there's two different ways of salvation, one for Old Covenant and one for New Covenant. But the Bible tells us there's been one way all along, and there's been one plan. 
70% of our Bibles are the Old Testament. Don't neglect it. We need to be in the Old Testament. Um, and Paul evidently did not subscribe to the popular notion in America today made by some of our most popular preachers in America that we need to unhitch the gospel from the Old Testament. Paul obviously isn't subscribing to that. He's literally bringing up like the big guys of the Old Testament, Abraham and David, as examples of salvation. And so why Abraham? Why is the salvation of Abraham important to talk about? I mean, this is centuries before. Why is this even a deal? Well, it's, why are we talking about Abraham? Why is it important for us to talk about Abraham? Well, almost everybody believes certain things about Abraham, our forefather. And he's going to talk, he's zoning in on some things, particularly for the Jews. But this is not the first time that Abraham has been brought up. I mean, Luke brings this up in the gospel when the rich man in Hades, his father Abraham, sends someone to this. Abraham's brought up. Um, he's brought up in Galatians. He's brought up in James uh, in this way. Judaism obviously claims Abraham as the father of the Jewish people. And Muslims even claim Abraham as a father of their religion. He is considered the first Muslim. Christians obviously claim Abraham as one of our forefathers in the faith. How many of you grew up as a kid singing, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had father, and you do the motions, and you really get into it. One author I read, actually, she said that that song is a good summary of this chapter, uh, that we are saved, but also added to the family of God, and we are Abraham's children indeed. And so Christians claim Abraham as a father of our faith. Samaritans claim Abraham, Rastafarians, Baha, all claim Abraham as some type of a father of their faith. So Abraham's salvation has a broad relevance to lots of people. There are people within a stone's throw of this church that follow a faith other than Christianity that claim Abraham. And so talking about how Abraham is saved is relevant. It's extremely relevant. We don't have to make the Bible relevant. It already is. And the Jews, in their view of Abraham, sought to boast in their works. Now remember, he just told us in chapter 3 that what becomes of our boasting, verse 27, it's excluded. That boasting excluded, pride I have based, I'm only a sinner saved by grace. We thank God, for, it, it, we respond in humble, thanks, humble thanksgiving. This is our story. This is our song. To God be the glory, I'm only a sinner saved by grace. And there's no boasting, but the Jews wanted to boast. And, and they boasted in Abraham. So why did Paul pick Abraham? They thought that Abraham was someone that could boast in what he did because of his own righteousness. They thought that why did God pick Abraham? Well, they thought because he did something good or there was something good about him. Paul brings up a couple questions. Well, we know Abraham sinned in the Old Testament because the Bible tells us that. So how did he stay righteous if he earned righteousness? Didn't he lose it in some way? Or, if it was by obeying the law, wait, didn't Abraham come before Moses, and Moses came, the law came with that, so how did he obey the law that hadn't been given yet? And they have a lot of theories, and there's a lot of things in different Jewish writings to explain that away, but these are some arguments that Paul brings up. In fact, in the first Maccabees, um, about a century before Jesus, the speaker writes, and he talks about um, actually the same one that incited the revolt against the Syrians and for which Hanukkah is celebrated, wrote that Abraham was found faithful and was tested and it was counted or reckoned to him as righteousness. And he's mixing Genesis 15 and Genesis 22 together. Others said that Abraham was declared to be righteous by his circumcision. Or others would say he was declared to be righteous by his offering up of Isaac. In that way, and the Syriac even states that Abraham kept the law before it was even given. It's like, wait, he obeyed the rule before he knew what the rule was? How did he do that? Um, these are all things to boast in, and there's other Jewish writings that take different passages of the Old Testament, put that in. Ecclesiasticus, which is one of the, the other apocryphal books, as well as the book of Maccabees, um, conflate a lot of these things. 
So Paul responds to that with this question that you'll see in verse 3. I want you to get this. I really want you to get this one. For what does the Scripture say? How was Abraham saved? Paul cuts straight to the chase, right to the jugular. What do the Scriptures say? Not what does Judaism say. Not what does Ecclesiasticus or the, the, the Syri, Syriac or any of the, the Maccabees or what does Islam or Baha or even Christianity or what some rabbi or, or what other teacher or podcast preacher or whatever. But what does God say in the text? Take it straight to the mat. What does the text say? In a sense, what he's saying is by what standard? Everybody in this room has a presupposition and a standard by which you're basing your arguments and say, how can you be saved? Let me ask you, how many of you that are Christians maybe grew up and there's somebody else that was in your house, maybe a sibling or maybe a friend that you went to youth group with and you believed on Christ and are saved and they're not? Anyone have someone like that? Heard the same gospel, same teachings, everything. What makes you saved and them not? job Dan if your answer is anything to do with you you're in the same boat as the Jews claiming to boast in what right in what Abraham's saying so there are many opinions out there about how Abraham was saved and how salvation comes but Paul by saying what do the scriptures saying is by what by what standard person's idea a religious practice their heritage or a prejudice that they have they might point to some authority outside of them why do you think this and how does salvation come and there's people today how, how do you get to heaven why should God let you into heaven on what basis should God, God allow you to be right with God and they would say well I heard or I thought and they'll appeal to di different authorities in their life they might appeal to um, a book or something or their religion they might even appeal to great authorities out there like YouTube videos. I watched a YouTube video, and it was this. In fact, this is a, a fun thing, because a lot of folks that would want to oppose the Bible or claim to be some type of agnostic that would not believe in something, they often will just repeat arguments that they saw on YouTube the night before. Um, or they'll appeal to like a meme on Facebook or to a Taylor Swift song or to the highest authority that they can claim their own personal emotions and I say this in sarcasm because someone will say well the Bible says this and they'll say well I just feel that God wouldn't this oh so your feelings your emotions are a higher authority than the actual scriptures okay um, and this is and this is where people will go and all of these ideas of where something comes from are the wisdom of humans the worldly wisdom and put up against the word of God is what Paul does. He says, what do the scriptures say? And then he quotes from Genesis 15. What do the scriptures say? Abraham, if you notice your Bible probably has quotation marks there, or maybe it's set apart. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. The scriptures are the standard by which we understand salvation. Paul would not fit into the into the doctrine doesn't matter crowd because if someone says well I don't want to do doctrine and theology I just want to love Jesus and as soon as you say well who is Jesus then well he is the son of God he's the divine he's the eternal okay you just did theology and doctrine doctrine matters Paul would not fit into that crowd that says it doesn't matter the, the, the scriptures tell us the scriptures are the standard by which we understand salvation and understanding the scriptures is essential to understanding the gospel I mean think of this Romans the greatest doctrinal book in the whole old test in the whole new testament is also the fullest explanation of the gospel one person I read this week said that what the scriptures say is both informative and normative for grasping the gospel message Paul has been talking about this throughout Romans. Go, flip go back over to chapter 1 when he, verse 16 and 17, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and the salvation. But go back up to verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, uh, apostle set apart for the gospel of God. And then verse 2 of chapter 1, 
which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures. That this is a promise, it's a plan. It's planned in the scriptures. Its authority is bound in the text. And it's all about, verse 3, concerning his son. And he even identifies who descended from David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul is giving us this here. So the scriptures are how we know what the scriptures say. It's important. Jesus loves me. This I know. Why? For the Bible tells me so. Paul makes a few fundamental points about the gospel as he comes through here. The gospel Paul proclaimed is not novel. It's something, it's something God has been planning. Paul believed that the saving promise made to Israel in the Old Testament would not be fulfilled in the, it would now be fulfilled in the gospel that he was preaching. That the message was that the message of the gospel was preceded in redemptive history. That the message Paul was preaching is not new. It's rather a fulfillment. It was something that was preached beforehand. The scriptures are the basis of this. So brothers and sisters, when, when John would say, these things are written that you may know you have eternal life, that there's an implication there that, that the scriptures are the authority by how we know salvation. And my feelings and my memory of an event of conversion will probably change, but the scriptures don't. And so this is why so many throughout, through how many saints that we would, and Paul would even say when he says in 1 Corinthians 15, I delivered what I received. It's not something he came up with. It was something, it was not a new way of salvation. He was preaching the old, old story that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This, this has been repeated in hymns throughout the ages. One of my favorite, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. What's the sweetest frame? Are you looking, uh, picture frames? No. It, it, the frame or the idea or the background or the, even the person, the sweetest, the nicest one, I'm not going to trust in that, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name. Salvation through his blood. My hope is built on nothing else. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. It's based upon the scriptures. And then verse 3, that salvation is by faith. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him as righteousness. Salvation is by faith alone. Salvation is in the Old Testament. Salvation's source and standard is the scriptures. And thirdly, salvation is by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. Paul points that Abraham is justified before he did any of the works that we know Abraham for. Paul points out that he was justified before the law was even given. And to support that, he quotes Genesis 15, 6, quoted here in Romans 4, as well as in Galatians 3 and in James 2. And it says that Abraham believed God and it was counted. Now that word counted is used 11 times in chapter 4. It's used several times right here. Logizomai. It's translated in various New Testament English Bibles as counted, reckoned, considered, imputed or computed maybe your bible has one of those words there it's an accounting term it's a legal term it's a judicial term he counted or credited or reckoned or and you say that's a little that's a little old sounding word or an appalachian type word but it, it reconcile you reconcile your bank account you consider it or come up with a something you you we don't impute but we think of computing or compute something i add something up in my computer and it it came to computations there and it's imputed it's put there it's something that's changed douglas moo said to account him as righteous that does not inherit with a righteousness that doesn't belong to him. It's adding something. You all probably had stuff happen like this. Uh, I had something happen recently. 
There's a charge on a credit card, had to go back. And they're, okay, we're going to credit your account with that amount. It was returned item or as a false charge. We're going to credit that. It was counted or imputed to my account. That much, much money. There wasn't like something going, it was just they just shh, shh, boom, and here's what they did. It was a credit. It was, it was imputed to that account. That money was put there. It wasn't mine originally, it was put there. That's what this word means. To count, reckon, consider, impute. Thinking this. And it's an affirm, and to affirm something is to deny something else. It, we've said this before. If I say, I take Jamie to be my wife, that implies forsaking all others, right? So when you affirm one thing, it means you're denying something else. So there's the positive and the negative. By saying we believe that Abraham was count justified by faith, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness, that means there's some things that we don't believe. We don't believe then that Abraham was declared righteous by his works. We don't believe that Abraham was then, Abraham was not then declared righteous by his circumcision, the sign of the covenant, even a faith that would be expressed in that sacrament. He was not saved and counted righteous by keeping the law. Galatians goes on to this as well. In Galatians 3, verse 6, it says, Just as Abraham, and quotes Genesis 15, believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, how is Abraham made right with God? Just as Abraham, connecting word, here comes about what they had spiritually. Abraham was not an Israelite originally. He's a pagan from Ur of the Chaldees. The, the, he, he, he gives this, that Abraham is saved by his faith. How does Paul understand his faith? He gives it here in Romans 4, which is the best commentary on Gen Galatians 3, and Romans 4 work together. Abraham is not an example of being saved by works. Abraham is an example of being saved by faith. Abraham is saved not by human achievement, but by divine accomplishment. What do we learn from Abraham? He is saved by faith. Now, his faith wasn't perfect faith he had this faith Genesis 15 believe God and counted him as righteousness two chapters over Sarah is laughing later in the story he's messing up and denying this and hiding this he, he, he has a wavering and changing faith just like all of us but he has faith faith excludes boasting and so he, and then we come to verse so verse 4 it says now to the one who works his wages are counted as a gift but as his due I mean a wage is something someone earns it's not a gift he turns that on its head and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly his faith is counted as righteousness I want you to think of the scandal of Paul when he writes this that he's writing and these Jews are going to read this where he is saying that the forefather of their faith and his faith also is an unrighteous man and that's like when someone comes and says man your grandpa was a dirty rotten scoundrel and to we, which we all say I'll see you in the parking lot after the service okay um, and it, they're, they're saying something here who justifies the ungodly. Who's he referring to? The context is Abraham. This is an astounding statement. It's the, actually a key verse, I think, of this section. He lumps Abraham in with the ungodly. Not, that, not what religion teaches of human achievement. All of religions are trying to get right with God. The gospel is this message that grace precedes human acts that Abraham did not perform meritorious acts to earn his salvation. He believed God who counted him to be righteous. J.I. Packer said this, he says, nobody can produce new evidence of our depravity that will make God change his mind. God justified you knowing the worst about you. I want you to think about this. When he talks of Abraham, he says, who justifies the ungodly. That if God can save Abraham, an unjust, ungodly man, a pagan man from Ur, he can save you. 
and there's no new sin or new thing about you, if God says, hey, I'm offering, a, offering salvation, that he's not going to say, oh, did you know this about lawn? Okay, that's all off now. Didn't know about that. No, there's no new evidence that can come up. He saves you and accepts you as your sin, in your sin. So the doctrine of faith alone offends natural sensibilities that seek to do something to earn our salvation. So we don't trust obedience as a way to be saved. We stop working to be saved. We trust the transfer. On what basis do we get to go to heaven? Who gets to go to heaven? If you were answering this question, question or on what basis does someone get to go to heaven? Or who gets to, if there's a heaven, who gets in and who doesn't? And why? And sometimes people will answer. Even people in this room would probably answer that question in ways like this. They might say, um, they, some might say, that, that because I tried the best I could to be a good Christian. Or someone might say, because I believed God and tried to do His will. That's why I should get to go to heaven. Or because I believed God with all my heart. Or because I did God what, what God wants. I got saved. I accepted. I prayed the prayer. And all of those responses reveal some type of a belief, even a Christianized version of a belief, that salvation is by works. One might believe in faith plus works. I got to believe in Christ, but I also have to do this. Whether that be a sacrament, whether that be a prayer or a rite. Or I got to believe in Jesus or faith as a work. That my faith has to be a work. I got to do this to be saved. I got to pray this prayer, walk that aisle, do that to be saved. And all of that is seeing faith as a work or faith plus works. But the Bible way of salvation is faith alone. Sola fide. God offers a way for us to be accepted. Not on our own actions. He is the object of our faith. I want you to get this because this I hope will help some folks that maybe are struggling with assurance of their salvation. That is a gift through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's not our actions. So faith is not the cause of our salvation. It's the means of our salvation. The cause, it's God's grace, what Jesus has done for us. So the object of our faith is what gives it its power, not the faith itself. It is important because we can think that faith is something that causes our salvation, but no, faith is the means. Grace is the cause. We're saved by grace through faith and it not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, Ephesians 2. And for some that they may lack assurance because we look at our faith rather than we look at the object. Well, did I pray? Did I mean it? Did I pray the right words? Was I really sincere? Well, no, look at the object of your faith. My faith has found a resting place in Christ. As we sang, all I have is Christ. That's it. Faith alone, in Christ alone. Your faith is not the cause of your salvation. It's the means by which you're saved. Grace is the cause. Faith in Jesus, not in works or anything. Baptism, membership, works, anything. Some ways that this justification has been the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which is also repeated in the Baptist Confessions of Faith. Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all of our sins and accepts us as righteousness, righteous in the sight of God only for the righteousness of Christ imputed, computed, thought, reckoned by, received by faith alone. It's question 33. So, we are declared justified by faith. It is imputed. It is counted. It's not infused by us. Other views would say that this righteousness is not counted by our faith, but it's infused to us at baptism. And the Roman church would still teach that the instrumental cause of salvation is the infusion of grace through baptism.
And they would still say it's by faith, but they would say it's faith is a necessary condition sufficient. It's like having the sticks and wood is on the fire. But what Paul is saying, and what Luther said, is that Abraham believed God, and it, the faith, was counted to him as righteousness. It wasn't, there didn't need to be a second plank or faith plus works, a plank of confession or contrition or to mean it or of priestly absolution or works of, salva- of sanctification like alms or Hail Marys or Our Fathers or, in, or any congruous or alongside merit. No, it's only by faith. The meritorious cause of our justification is not baptism, not congruous merit through any works of our own, but the meritorious cause of our justification is the work of Jesus alone. What he did. And so we just believe it. So you say, okay, what's it mean to believe? I don't need to believe in my belief. And we already talked about faith, not in our faith, not making faith the works. So what, what in the world is faith then, Jason? I'm a little confused. There's three elements of faith. There's the content of faith. It matters what you believe. That you're not faith in faith alone, or faith, but you're faith in Jesus. The object of our faith, that's the data. Faith, and then it's an assent that to the truth. There are a lot of people, that if I asked, do you believe in God? Do you believe Jesus died for sins? They'd say, oh yeah, but they're not saved. It's an assent that Jesus died for you. And that you are ascending and your faith is resting on that for you. And then it's a trust. It's a dependence. It's a dependence that that is, I've used the chair illustration up here, that that is what I'm sitting on. I'm sitting on what Jesus did, not what Jesus and I did or anything. I'm not relying or mixing our dependence. I'm not sitting on two chairs. I'm dependent on Jesus alone. And then this, he, this, and then he through that faith imputes or counts the righteousness of Jesus to me, that legally God deals with Jesus in terms of our sins, and legally God gives us Jesus' righteousness. It's not what we do. It's something that he did, and he gives us Jesus' righteousness. So how do we get it? We get it by faith. I heard a story of a kid that was in a track meet and he was in the long jump for the first time and he wasn't very good and so he did the jump and then when they started reading and he didn't hear him read off his 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 jump and how far he jumped but when they started giving the awards out they read his name and then they list then they gave the kid that actually had the longest jump his jump they had mixed up they had given the the winning jump to this kid's name. They credited it to this kid. And he's like, whoa, I did really well. And he really didn't do well. And they fixed it later and everything like that. But in a sense, that's what happens in salvation. That we mess up. That we fall short of the glory of God. We have the shortest jump. I mean, we can't swim. We've talked about this. We're trying to swim across the ocean. Uh, you, You can barely swim, or you can be a decent swimmer, or you can be Michael Phelps. You're not gonna get from Ocean City to Europe. You're not gonna, so there's God's perfectness and there are some people that are going to perform good things and be more moral than somebody else but they still can't cross that chasm of the righteousness of God for all of sin and come short of that and we're, 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 but, but what happens is the one who does his faith is kind of he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him so how do we get this faith Whereas the other hymn says, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. This is what it is, that I renounce what I'm depending on and I rely on Christ and Christ alone. And this is the truth that turned the whole world upside down in the, Re- in the Reformation. This is the whole truth that changed the world in the New Testament and it's the truth that'll change your life too. That you're not saved, you're not right with God by religion or works or anything else, but simply by believing on Christ and what he did on the cross for you. And Abraham is a great example of that. 
And so let's look to that as our example as well. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for this text, and we're so grateful for the means by which we can be saved through faith alone. A faith that is resting on what Jesus did for us on the cross alone. And so, Lord, I pray that our confidence today for those that do not know Christ that they would turn from believing in something they've done or a religious background and believe on Christ alone and I pray for those that are believers that we would not attempt to live the Christian life as if we have to earn your favor but that we would live in response to the favor we've received in Christ and you're not surprised by any of our sin and you accept us and we're so grateful oh God that you are the one who justifies the ungodly and that our faith is counted as righteousness so Lord help us to leave today not with guilt but with freedom and joy knowing that the record was switched that when you look at us you see the, the righteousness of Christ and not ourselves and we pray this